It's awesome. The troops are being rounded up now. They're coming on in, which is good. If the ushers uh, be proactive, get them in here and we'll settle down. The ushers might be able to hear me. R round the people up and get them in. I want them in and settled so, uh, so we can move on. Ten minutes is up. David only gave us ten minutes. They are like sheep, really, eh? Because sheep, you know, in the paddock, they go in long lines. Yeah, we need, yeah, we need, I'm the dog, I think. Yapping, yapping at their heels. All right. It's settling down now. Awesome. Well, bless the Lord. And uh, just thinking about, uh, you know, what the Lord's been doing over the last three or four days. And it's actually, if you look at it, um, it's just an amazing journey that God has taken us on. And, um, you know, with all the, I don't think we've had a conference with so many speakers uh, ever before in the history of the church. And, um, but it's, it's like the Lord just adds to and builds on and adds to and builds on and adds to and builds on. And it's, it's really just like a jigsaw puzzle that God puts together for us. And every component is important and significant uh, for us to get the whole picture that God really has for us. And um, it is really a great honour and a great privilege to have our sister Anne Morrow here with us today. Let's give her a welcome. And uh, I know um, as the story was being shared this morning, Anne would understand all the aspects of the story and would have been through that journey, know all about the hedgehogs and the arrows and the, and the battles and the struggles and the journey, you know, the journey that the Lord leads us on. It's a consistent journey and everybody, it's a fiery journey, fiery trials, all sorts of battles in there. But, um, you know, um, one of the things that has um, really stood out to me about Anne is Anne is such an encourager. And, um, you know, I'd been sort of away from the things of the city church um, for about 19 years or so, and there'd been a lot of battles and stuff that had gone on the church, and um, I'd said to someone the other day, I said, there, there wasn't one pastor in the city that had actually called me over that whole, I'm not, I'm not moaning about this whole period of time, and things started hitting the newspapers, and Anne Morrow popped out of the woodwork and um, just gave me a word, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And, um, you know, just, a, just um, it was very, very encouraging to me, Anne. It really blessed me. And it was almost like it wasn't just you. I just felt support. I just felt God was with me. You had heard you were there, and it, it just so encouraged me and strengthened me. And because we were going into new battles, you know, it was new territory, not new to you guys, but new to me. And, um, and so, yeah, what a blessing. And, um, and we just need to put our hands together and give her a welcome this morning. And <clears throat> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Murray. <clears throat> So I said to him before, what I felt like his parting words were, what more can one say? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I must say, I feel a wee bit like that, that too, because, um, and I just love times when God just so moves quite monumentally and quite sovereignly in our midst. And, um, and, and I thought, oh, I don't think I need to say anything. So... <laughs> But maybe he said to me, maybe I should. <laughs> but 
I, I do feel that God gives us this, these kinds of encounters and visitations, not just to make you feel good for the moment, but you're going to need them for the times that we are heading into. And they're not going to be times that you are just going to experience when you come together in this kind of forum, but you're going to know what it is and learn how what it is to drink from the living well. You're going to know what it is to go to the river and not only just look at it, but dive into it and know what it is to draw powerfully from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And um, I mean, I would love to um, promise you, and as Kauri mentioned the other day, other day, the future in the natural does not look great. But the thing is, God has gone before us. He's actually already prepared a place. He's already prepared the future for us. And I believe these times, quite sovereignly, God is equipping us, equipping you young people. God is putting something very solid, very real into your hearts and your spirits that are going to cause you to not only run the race well, but cause you to know what it is to flow in the river of God. So, um, and I truly do believe that, and thank you, Denise and David. <laughs> it was absolutely refreshing, wasn't it? And I really don't want to take away from that. I, but I just, um, I, I realise, I, I guess what we have been birthed in is a love for the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we used to think in our previous days that he was just an influence, but he is a very real, wonderful, loving person of the Godhead, someone that we can tangibly believe and love and experience. And, um, and I just really love what he does. And sometimes you go back to the word of God and to the principle of first mention. And you know when the Holy Spirit is first mentioned in the scriptures? It's in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. When the world, when the, what God had previously created had become void, had become wasteless, had become empty. But then, and if you stopped at verse 1, you would think, well, what happened? But what happened in verse to, it said, but the Holy Spirit brooded over that which was chaotic, which was empty, and what was void. And then the word of the Lord came, and God spoke, and we have creation. And I look at what we're in today, and I, rem and I remember that, and I think, wow, that's what you did in the beginning. How much more can you do it in the chaotic days than the times that we are living in? God can move and will and has promised, and we're beginning to taste it, and we We'll move again. Already. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And, um, and then that was a time once when the Holy Spirit was moving and God spoke, that which was dark and empty and void, there became light. And I, you know, and you will be so familiar with the scriptures in Isaiah, when darkness would cover the face of the earth, that the glory and the light of God will arise. And I so believe that. And I so think God just wonderfully gave us a beautiful time of refreshing. And, and I just, I loved it. <laughs> I didn't want it to stop. <laughs> I don't have Peter beside me to say, that's enough. <laughs> God took him. <laughs> oh, dear. But just to go back, Matthew 13, 52, and I, I mentioned this to Nancy recently. You know, we don't look back to in any weight, in any way to think that's where we're living. But, you know, so often in the scriptures, God says, go back and remember. 
Go back and remember. And when, even when you just think about communion, it, what is the time of that? Remember what I have done for you. Remember what it stands for. And I think um, in, the, uh, in that Matthew 13, 52, that when the scribes, they were bringing out treasure, they were bringing out new revelation, but they bought from the old and the new. And even though, and, and, I, and I am, so, so I, I guess I've had many uh, comments and said, and do you ever wish for the old days? And I say, oh no, I'm so grateful for the foundation. I'm so grateful for what God did. But that only gave me a foretaste and a hunger for what I believe he is about to do. Because we are moving from grace to grace, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. God never goes backwards when he comes in a move. And I believe we need a move of God like we have never, ever seen before. We carry a promise for that. We carry an expectation for that. But it's not only an expectation and it's not only a promise, it's an absolute necessity. It's absolutely imperative that we know what it is to see God move again. And, and I just love some of the scriptures that we used to pray. And I, I love this one in Habakkuk 3, when he says, this was the prayer of Habakkuk. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, it wasn't just coming into a prayer meeting saying, oh God, but it was set to wild, enthusiastic, and triumphant music. How's that for a kind of prayer? I think you would know something about that. And he said, oh Lord, I've heard the report of you and I was afraid, but oh God, revive your work in the midst of the years. And the revival was always, Lord, make yourself known. Oh, that our city would go know what God's like. Oh, that our nation would make, know what God's like. And it's just an absolute imperative that we know what it is to be blessed. You know, in Psalm 67, I think it is, it says, you know, why do we need to be blessed? That your way may be known upon the earth. And so what God does in this house, what God does in our lives, is not for you just to feel good, as wonderful as it is, but as imperative as because there's a city and there's a nation that needs to know what God's like. Oh God, make yourself known. So remembering your foundation and your history, how you have been established, I truly believe it enables you to walk into the future. And also, it's, it's an affirmation and a reminder, God, you can do it again. And I know you know this passage so well when it comes, because we haven't been called to a playground, but we've been called to a battleground. And David, when he came before Goliath, you know, he, as he, I, and I wonder if, and I just was so interested in what has been coming across, I think, Kelly, you might have shared a wee bit about it, and Corey. You know, are we indignant about what's happening in our nation? Are we, you know, what was it that stirred David as he faced Goliath? It says he was indignant. And I wonder if we, are we passive or I think God wants to put something within our heart and our spirit that we rise up from the inside and say, thus far and no further. Thus far and no further. And because he was indignant, he looked at it and, he, and that's what caused him to be motivated. But it was interesting. He said, he said, is there not a cause? And I was interested to read recently that in asking that question, David, I was asking three questions in that. What is our history? What are the promises God has given and what is our strategy? And I think those are important things to consider in this particular day. And he not only ran into the battle with five stones, but he carried his staff, which in the natural would have felt that would have encumbered him. But they used to carry their staff, and on their staff was their history. On their staff, they wrote the promises. And on the staff, they wrote the promises. 
the, um, and, and, and the strategy of what they were going to do. And I just think every battle we face, let's not forget the promises. Let's not forget the, um, what God has spoken to us. Let's not forget our history. And let's not forget the hearing of the voice of the God of what we are to really, really do. It's come out in so many times, I guess, as we've listened to the promises and the prophetic word. And Murray, did you share this? You know, it's one thing to actually have a prophetic word. It's one thing to have a promise. But, you know, there's a journey to see its fulfillment. And I think sometimes where a lot of people are disillusioned, they say, but God promised, or that I have this kind of word, but did you actually navigate and strategize the journey to see you become what God has really, really promised? And I, I really do believe that we are in the days of Elijah. I truly believe these are days when God said, I'm, when we'll see the rain outpoured. But when sometimes that's where we stop. But you know, Elijah, between the promise of rain and the outpouring was the place of intercession and the place of prayer. And you know, that's an incredible privilege, that place of prayer. I love what you've shared about it. It's, it's not just, um, I, I really think that, God's giving us a greater hunger and thirst to know him. And, and I think as we've heard so many of the speakers share about the encounters and the visions, actually didn't this morning make you hungry for more? And who wants to stay where they are? And I have just, I guess as I recount my own story, Something that has interwoven through it has been the cry of even ones close to me, Anne, why don't you just stay where you are? Why don't you be normal? <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite something in my day. But I, and so, I, and I had written this, I believe God divinely implants a sense of discontent with trivial living. Sometimes deep down in every believer, it mitigates against living an ordinary, comfortable, free, free, ex ex a free, a risk-free existence. And I think that's what God had planted in my heart and spirit. I never wanted to stay ordinary. I never wanted to stay in the status quo, but oh, there was always that reaching out for more. And um, there's times, you know, that when that, there's times when, you know, like I've looked at that scripture where Paul said to his followers, follow me as I follow Christ. And then I've looked at that and I thought, if I said to people, and I've mentored many, follow me as I follow Christ, and they look at my journey and they would say, you've got to be joking. <laughs> you've got to be joking. Why would I follow you? when? It, uh, because God never gives us a map, does he? And his great wisdom, he never gives us a map because we would never leave first base. <laughs> but, you know, we would have never experienced him either. We've never experienced the powerfulness of his love. We've never experienced the powerfulness of what it is to walk, to walk with him. And, and I know um, for me, it's probably from my teenage years, I was involved in an Anglican church and I used to go five times a day on a Sunday. <clears throat> and my family, we were a very close family. And they said, Anne, just go once or twice. Just be normal. <laughs> and, and then I met some people in Youth for Christ, and I got hooked up in the Riggerton Baptist. And then, so I started going there, and all of a sudden the Anglican Church was very attractive to my family, and just stay there. But then what happened, I got then involved with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
and the Pen and Pentecost at the Tent Crusades. And all of a sudden, the Baptist church was attractive to my family. And just stay there. But, you know, as we move forward in God, you know, it was through many tears because I never wanted to disappoint my family. I never wanted to... And I know that in one sense I was. I came from a family of five. My mother and dad were leaders and every one of us were leaders in our roles as well. So they had mapped out careers for us and I knew that in that area I was a disappointment to them. So I was got involved in the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. But not only that, I met Peter. <laughs> Well, that was almost the last straw <laughs> for my family. <laughs> and, um, and, and some of you know, know him. But he was a man of, of prayer and fasting. And I believe that what we were ushered into was because not only of his praying and fasting, but of many others. And you can say, it, and some people thought, it would have been lovely to live with a man like that. But I want you to say it was difficult at times. And I sometimes felt like he took the place of Mary at Jesus' feet. And I was the Martha banging the pots and the pans, trying to attract attention that I needed help as I was preparing a meal that Jesus was never going to eat. And I think Jesus said, he didn't even defend Mary. Uh, he didn't even, Jesus took and defended Mary and said, she has chosen the good part. But in all of other things that we have gone through, sometimes I've gone through some situations and I said, oh God, what are you doing now? And he said, I'm answering your prayers and I will say, which one? <laughs> Cancel. <laughs> I didn't understand. I didn't really mean it. <laughs> but you know what it was? It was always the prayer in Philippians chapter 3. Paul said, I count everything as loss compared to the priceless privilege of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord and becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. And for his sake, I have lost everything. And there have been times when I have really stood in that position, where I've had to make a choice to go this way or that way, and there has been a horrific cost. But I want you to say, as I want you to hear, even as I talk about days of Elijah, Elijah had Elisha following him, but there were many instances he said to Elisha, you stay here. But you know, Elisha said, no, I'm coming with you. No, you stay here. Now, what caused him to keep moving with Elijah? He had seen something of value, something that he so prized, something that he so longed for, that under no circumstance was he going to leave Elijah alone until he received what he had. And I think part of this conference has been, you have seen some things. And if God were to say to you, no, just stay where you are, you said, no way. I can never stay where I was before this kind of time. Because God has sown something into my heart of the hunger and the thirst to really know him for where he really, really was. And I'm not, um, so I, and it's interesting, you know, Jesus said to his disciples at one time, are you going to turn back also when you saw many leaving? And I love what Peter said. He said, well, where shall we go? You have the words of life and you have the words of truth. And as Denise said, we're ruined for anything less. We are absolutely ruined for anything less. So it was interesting just hearing as I go back to our beginning days, and I won't go over a lot of them, so it was a wonderful move that was happening with um, the Barton family. 
outstanding. But Peter came to Christchurch um, because God had spoken to him about building the walls in Nehemiah. And I was interested to hear you talk about that, Jonathan, <laughs> because that was part of a mandate that God gave us to build again. And then also Adullam's cave. <laughs> and the thing about Adullam's cave was that those... Actually, I, and I've spoken about this to many of the ones that came, but you know, though, who came, who came, those who were suffering hardship, everyone that was in debt, everyone who was discontented, he gathered them to himself and he became captain over them. But they didn't stay in that position. They became part of the army of the living God. They became a part of David's mighty army. And whatever visitation and whatever situation you're in, it's interesting, as, as um, Pastor Murray has already shared, if you are in a case of discouragement, if you are in a place of discontent, if you are in a place of great debt, you know, that's what the Spirit of the Lord is upon is for, to heal and restore, but not only heal and restore, but bring, us in, but bring us into a place where we become part of the army of the living God. And we're talking about God's glory and we say, well, who is the king of glory? Who is he? What are we talking about? And Isaiah says, the king of glory is the Lord mighty in battle. And I just, I just really feel really strong that you know, God is going to change you from a wimp into a warrior. <laughs> he really, really is. <sighs> Let me see, where shall I go? <clears throat> um, I, 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 probably the vision that we really had, we never had a vision for a large church. Um, I think Peter defied all the manuals that they wrote. <clears throat> um, and the thing was that we, we came into a season where God was moving wonderfully by his spirit. And there was such a deep, deep hunger in the churches and in the city for people to know the word of God, to know about him, to experience him. And we would have these... Um, these services weekly, actually they were more than weekly, nightly sometimes, and we had a call to Dunham's Cave and people from all denominations would come into those meetings and they would get profoundly and deeply encountered by the Holy Spirit and we had to cart them downstairs to even get them into their cars. And many of them went back to their churches. Peter said always encourage them to go back there, but many were not uh, welcomed, and so they began to gather to us. But I loved, I think, a key to a lot of it is, and those of you who knew Peter, um, he had not only a tremendous love for God, but a tremendous love for people. And we had the Catholic nuns and the priests sitting in our services. I never wanted to get too close to them at Christmas time because they were half inebriated <laughs> when they got to our services. <laughs> The priests. But you know, um, and it has been documented that he was a catalyst for the move of the Holy Spirit amongst the Catholics. And why was that? Because he was a man who loved people. And sometimes he, he was um, so spontaneous. He would invite people to our house for supper and in such a way that they thought they were the only one, and then you'd tell me that we're having a few, and I'd get there and sometimes there were over 60 people waiting to come into our land. And everyone thought they were the only one. It was quite interesting to see. <sighs> I bless you, darling. <laughs> But as a church, I know we were pioneers. And I think the, some of the areas that we pioneered in what were the area and the passion to, to equip people, not only to come to know the Lord, but to be equipped to fulfill the destiny and the mission. And this was expressed in the Bible college that 
we started and we lived in for 19 years, and that was an amazing privilege and challenge. And then we also were part of the Living Springs kind um, vision. And Peter was one who used to get these ideas. For example, um, we ha both Peter and I had missionary calls. I expected to live my life in South America, single and hidden. It sort of changed. <laughs> Peter had a vision for missions in Africa. But I think because of the mission call in our own hearts, we were able to see that expedited through our churches. We sent out many very, very fine missionaries. But I'm ashamed to say to you, we used to send them out what we called by faith. That means very little. It means we will send you and we will stand in faith believing that God will provide for you. And Peter came to me one day and he said, Anne, I think we should go off a wage. We should do what we're requiring them to do. So he came and said, Anne, I think we should go off our wage and not tell anyone and that we learn to live by faith. Now, I struggled a bit for that at the moment. I thought of, as a young mum, I thought, oh, oh. And I had a scripture, I said to him, but the Bible says, <clears throat> you shall not muzzle the ox. And he graciously said, Anne, will you think about it and pray? And I thought to actually satisfy what I had said, I'd look up that word again in the Amplified. And I guess this was the time that probably I wish I didn't have an Amplified because when you looked at it, it Amplified and said, Paul said, yes, it's true. You shan't muzzle the, act, the ox. But Paul went on to say, but I chose not to exercise my right. And even though that was directional, it was also a word of faith. Okay, Father, if this is the direction you want us to take. And so we went off a wage that only the treasurer knew. And I don't know for how long we did that. It was a considerable time. And to see God provide was absolutely amazing. And um, practically to see God provide. And can I say, <laughs> the days of Elijah were days when the streams dried up. Corrie mentioned we're going to face calamities. But if you are in a position where you need to cry out to God for provision, don't balk at it today, because God is teaching us how to live in another dimension. And, you know, learn to know, okay, God, your word says you are your provider, but we really don't need to know that in our kind of culture. There are a few that would. But, you know, I think God wants us to know what it is to have our eyes on him and that we are going to go through situations where we say, oh, my God, he is teaching us in these kind of ways. And then there was another situation with Living Springs. He came to me, and, and that's another whole story, but the financial side was it because um, our church... We had an eldership of about 12, and there was one elder who did not really agree in the purchasing of the property of Living Springs. But Peter was in a turmoil because he so felt it was God. So he said, Anne, um, I think we should sell our house and put a deposit on the land. And I had been in this journey before with him. <laughs> And I said, okay, let's put it to the test. Well, in two days, it was sold. And so we put, that was our family home, we put it, the deposit, on Living Springs, hoping that that would persuade this one elder, yeah, we need to come in and support them. <coughs> but they went till 3 o'clock in the morning, this particular morning, and he said, no, I don't believe we should buy it. 
And Peter, on principle, said, okay, I'll just trust God for this. And at three o'clock the next afternoon, someone came to us who we knew not closely and began to share a vision. They had prayed every day up in the hills. And they were asking God, what, what can we do? We've been looking at property. Where shall we go? And the Lord said to them, just go and see Peter Morrow. And he was really disappointed because he said, why would I go and see him? <laughs> True. <laughs> but the thing was, he shared his vision and Peter could not believe it. It was such, the vision was exactly the same as ours. And within a week, that whole property deposit was paid. And it was just a miraculous combination of two families where God sometimes will test you in the areas of finance. But I do honour Peter in a terms of integrity. In that area, he did not require anything of anyone else that he was not prepared to walk himself. And um, that was really quite amazing. And just one other thing in those earlier days... I mean, we think today is incredible. The battle has intensified, and yes, it has. But in 1977, we wanted to be part of what we called was a United Women's Conference. And I went along to some of the preliminary meetings and realised that the basis for the conference was the 1974 Communist Manifesto. And I began to think, there's no way we can be part of this. As it devalued the role of women as mothers, it de they were angry at authority. There was a slandering, there was an abuse. It was just unbelievable, the meeting. So I said, okay, Lord, what do we do? And I felt God challenge us to raise another voice. And this is where he gave me that scripture, Jonathan, about fighting. You said, don't be afraid, but remember the Lord is great and awesome and fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, and fight for your homes. And so God gave us a strategy. They were having a, a, this conference in the in town hall and in the university. They had 34 seminars, and I felt God said, you arrange the exact same setting, only with the Christian voice. So three weeks prior to the United Women's Conference, we had the Save Our Homes Conference, we had it at the town hall, we had it at the university, we had 34 seminars that spoke the word of God to every one of the issues. We were on, you talk about being on the news and on television, we were, we were right up there because they saw these two conferences as a conflict. It was a clashing of the kingdoms. But I tell you, the souls that came to know the Lord through that particular kind of time, and I think when God gives you an anointing, when God gives you, fills you with the Holy Spirit, it's not to make you feel good. I believe he wants you to be raised up as a voice. A voice, and it doesn't always have to be in a protest, but it can be in a positive way to express the light and the the power of God. And, and that just led us to some amazing things. I'll just slip over. <clears throat> because when you're walking with God, I loved the scriptures in Philippians where it says, Oh God, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. But often before that, there's a fellowship of his sufferings. And everything does not go according to your plan or my plan. And sometimes we wonder, oh God, why do these things happen to us? And, I, and it was in 1987, I was actually, I had been away from home for three weeks ministering in Australia and I was actually at my last conference in Perth, and we had the most amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's like everything broke out. There was a tremendous worship. There was an adoration. There was a rejoicing. There was a crying. And I went to bed that evening, and I had one more meeting, and I said, oh, God, where does one go to from here? I found out four hours later with a call from home that an intruder had come into our house. 
with an intention to murder my husband and that they were now fighting for Peter's life and that two of my sons were in hospital with injuries as well. The next morning in the paper was the ad, triple murder averted. So you're up here and then all of a sudden you're like this. And I remember as I stepped onto the plane, it was just an incredible encounter. But I stood up literally on the inside and I said, Lord, I know it was wonderful to worship you in that environment. It was wonderful to declare who you are. It was wonderful to declare that you are my God. And, but I want you to know, and I spoke to the enemy and I said, but I want you, Satan, to know that whatever I face, I didn't know whether I was going to walk into Christ Church knowing if Peter was dead or alive. But I said, I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you. And I tell you, no matter what you go through, no matter what, how difficult it may be, no matter how it derails you or alters the circumstances of your life, let that become from, and I didn't have to think about that, that came from the depth within my being because God had already, through the teaching and through what we had experienced, through times of prayer, of previous times of wonderful worship, I had put my hand up when everything's going good. I had responded to many altar calls, but this was the time. Wow, I will worship you. And I think God wants to impart that kind of a spirit into every one of you because you're going to face adversity. But I tell you what, it wasn't the times that I have grown the most, the times when my revelation encounters of God have been the most precious, haven't been on the mountaintop, they've been in the valleys where I have come to really discover and find out who God really, really is. And it did derail us in the sense of ministry in one terms. I remember I used to go regularly to the church on a Sunday and just afternoon and just lay before the Lord on the altar. And I remember one particular encounter where I took, because God does mantle us, but I took, I said, Lord, I can see the journey is very, very different. And I said, I, he doesn't take from us. He gives us the opportunity to just give back. And I said, Lord, I, 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 I literally took off a mantle and I folded it up and I said to the Lord, I thank you for the awesome privilege of knowing what it was to walk in that kind of anointing, knowing what it was to carry that anointing, knowing the favour that it carried, knowing the honour that was attached to it. But Father, in worship today, I take that off and I give it back to you. And as I did that, I felt his love and I felt his pleasure and I felt his kindness. And sometimes... The an old, when you feel like you're disrailed or there's been huge change, we only minister in a mantle because of the gifting of God. And sometimes as I was sitting with Peter in church and I would say, oh God, things are so different. But he said to me, Anne, you are preaching a more powerful message in the way you walk this journey than what you would have as you were standing in the pulpit. And I think that's true. God, everything we give is to him. And the adversity that you face, I want to say to you, don't try and sidestep it, but realise you are being prepared and refined and cleaned up for an incredible walk with God. And there was a sense too... <coughs> I'm, 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 I did miss this, but maybe I'll go back to it because there's always been a cry in our heart for revival. I was one, everything happened around me and I would say, God, what's wrong with me? And then we had this speaker come over from this, this was a pastor's wives and leadership conference and they were getting profoundly touched, profoundly, dramatically expressive 
and I'm just there. I'm feeling my heart is being soft, but nothing dramatic. And then we went to the next conference. By this time, I was desperate, and I said, Oh, God, whatever it costs, please meet with me. I don't want to be left out. And sometimes in the midst of worship, the Holy Spirit moves in another kind of way. And we were just singing, Oh, Jesus. And there's something very beautiful and very powerful about that name. And we were singing, What a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. In the midst of that, the Holy Spirit convicted me of an area of sin. And I rebuked it at the first. I thought it was a distraction. And we've heard a lot about repentance over this conference. And we had spoken into that. And I had asked God to clean my heart, as you would before you go to those kind of conferences. <coughs> But he spoke to me very specifically about an area and I said, in the middle of the worship, and I said, oh God, I'm sorry, I'll talk about that to you later. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a fabulous song leader, Simon, she said, Anne, what are we doing? I said, just keep singing. <laughs> because there was a wrestle on the inside. Oh, God, I wanted you more than anything else. And so I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? He said, I want you to confess it to the conference. I, <laughs> I said, sing again. <laughs> sing again. They said, and what are you doing? I said, just sing. Because in there was a cry of my heart. I just didn't want to confess something and it fall to the ground. And I not experience the brokenness and experience what it cost him on the cross to bear my sin. And it was the, the, the thing that God convicted me on was the area of pride in relation to what God was doing in the midst and had been doing. So I stood up while I was already standing and I said, I really feel God wants me just to confess this to you. And as I confessed it, it's still very real in my heart. I had such a vision of the cross. And I saw it was because of my sin that he went to the cross. It was because of my sin that nailed him there. And as I saw that, I, as I confessed the sin of pride, and God doesn't condemn you. He only very specifically convicts you. And as I confessed it, I fell in a crumbled heap on the platform. And from there on, that meeting went on for about another three or four hours. As people came up and got right with God, confessed areas where they had held grievances, and it was just an amazing move of the Holy Spirit. There were about four or five leaders who could not relate to it. They went upstairs to a mezzanine floor and they got the laughter. Then they were confused as they looked over the balcony and saw many people just crying out to God, being reconciled. And they said, what's wrong with us? And our speaker said, you are an expression of what heaven feels about what's happening down here. When the scripture says, when one repenteth, all of heaven rejoiceth. And after that, I didn't want to lead the conference after that next morning. I want to say to the speaker, no, someone else. She said, no, Anne, you will continue to lead this and they will know that you are an honest sinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But do you know what? I have never felt so free. I never felt so clean. I never felt so pure before him. That's the powerful work of confession and the powerful work of repentance. 
to be clean before him. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Job says, he that hath clean hands shall wax stronger and stronger. And, I, and we've talked a lot about repentance here, and I think it's one of the greatest gifts you can ask God for. Encounters with God, that gift of repentance frees me from my sin. It frees me from shame. It frees me from the implications because he took it all. And I say, oh, God, you are absolutely amazing. Just this last little story. <clears throat> of course, after Peter had the attack, we went, went into a journey of Alzheimer's. And it was... Probably they were very painful times, but very amazing times. But you know what concerned us? And Peter said, Anne, what's going to happen to us? What about our future? And I said, darling, I don't know. I don't know, but we will still worship. We will still pray. And I would go into classes where... Um, patient where people were dealing with Alzheimer's and I'd come out bawling my eyes out because of the total disfiguring of personalities and people who they were but the wonderful thing about Peter was it never touched his spirit the fire and the water passed over him and he was still a praying man he was so lucid and nighttime he'd wake up and he'd be praying and I used to say oh god I wouldn't shape up as good as that because it was who he was, but about our future, <clears throat> something we're all concerned about. He said, Anne, what's going to happen? And we went up to Rodney Howard Brown, and of course we were believing for a miracle. Many were praying, many prophetic words, and both Peter and I were <laughs> laying down after being prayed for, and I felt like we were in a shadowy grave. And we had been talking about our future, how different it was going to be. And then in that, you know, the visitations of God, out of the way in the background, I began to see this light and I realised it was the Lord. And as you just said, Denise, absolutely indescribable, absolutely dazzling of incredible beauty, incredible power, incredibly loving. And as he walked towards us, Peter and I both rose up together to meet him. And I thought, he's going to say, I just love you. Which, as we drew close to him, he reached out his arms, he encompassed us both. And not only did we experience his love, but he took us into himself. And when I looked at the vision again, there was no longer Peter and I. It was just Christ. And he said, Anne, this is your future. For your lives are hid with Christ in God. And it was just an incredible encounters that God just led us through. I just want to say, whatever you go through, God has gone before you. And I'll maybe just close on this thought. <clears throat> because I believe we are called into a huge battle. Not to be overwhelmed, but to overcome. I love the fact that we can pray in tongues powerfully. And, and I love what Norma Cloud used to say, we're armed, but are we dangerous? And instead of the sons of Ephraim, they were armed as archers and carrying bows, yet they turned back in the day of battles. And this is the thing I say, oh God, um, someone talked about our hearts. God is not dealing, uh, is not just after motivations and what we say, but in our hearts, is there a divided heart? Or can we say, God, my heart is given over to you?
And in those places of intimacy, again, um, Song of Solomon was, has been so very, very precious to me. And in and, and my walk with God, I have longed for intimacy. But, you know, the first thing she said, oh, God, I want a face-to-face -face relationship. I want you to kiss me. But, you know, that kiss was something not only spoke of first love and intimacy, but that kiss also inflamed her heart but equipped her for war. And oh, when we're talking about the bride, she is going to be so equipped and so powerfully equipped for war. And so my Peter used to love the war. He loved the battles. He was like the war horse in Job, pouring in the battle, smelling the battle afar off and rearing to go. And I was like the ostrich with my head in the sand. And I said, look, I'll come up when it's all over. But who was changed? I wasn't changed. But I tell you what, it showed me, Anne, face the battles. Because there's a grace, there's a learning, there's a strengthening, there's an understanding, there's a revelation in every battle that you face that will equip you for the days that are ahead. <sighs> Young people, <clears throat> God is looking over your hearts and I believe he wants to raise up some Daniels who absolutely go against the flow. You can be in the Babylonian environment, you can be in so many of the Babylonish influences, but because of what God places in your heart, and I, and I say this for all of us, there's something that will be so predetermined that we will have courage and grace to go against the flow. Because in the days of Elijah, these are days of confronting. In the days of Elijah, these are days when God will pour out his spirit. In these days, and I say, oh God, I want to be part of a church like that. Like that Pro Proverbs 31, we speak about being a woman, being a woman, a woman's nightmare. But I tell you, look at it through the eyes of a church. The Hebrew word describes this woman it's as one who is connected with military prowess. She's a warring wife, translated mighty, wealthy, excellent, Full, morally righteous, full of substance, integrity, strength, mighty like an army. And I truly believe that's what God is visiting us for. That's what God is equipping us for. That's what God is giving you revelation and encounters for, that we shall be like the army of the living God. Have you put your hand up for that? <clears throat> I surely have. And I just really thank the Lord that by his grace, he's given me a promise <clears throat> three years ago that within four years, I will see the fulfillment of the cry of her heart. And I'm not waiting for revival. I believe we've already entered it. We are already, we are tasting of outpourings of the Holy Spirit, but it's just the beginning it's just the beginning. There is so much more. And I thank you, Molly, um, Nancy and Murray, for being forerunners, for being catalysts, for what I believe God wants to do in these days. He wants our city to know what he's like. He wants our nation to know what he's like. And what, we, what he does in this nation is not just for us. I believe God has put a call on New Zealand that what he does in here will go to the nation, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so I believe we are incredibly strategic times. Every one of you matters. Every one of you will receive a fresh call for today, the day in which we are living. So I said, Lord, no matter what I go through, no matter where I am, I will be predetermined in my heart that I will worship you. I will be one that shall prepare the way of the Lord. And that preparation is that I'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that when he convicts, I will be a quick responder. When he causes me to... It challenged me, I will be a quick obeyer. 
Oh, what a day. What a day. We are born for such a day as this. It's in his grace and his mercy that he visits us to strengthen us, to give us, equip us for the days that are ahead. I believe this morning was monumental. It was a foretaste. You can have as much of God as you want. He said the river's flowing. You can go in knee deep. You can go up to your thighs. Or, you, or as was said, you can jump in and say, let the river carry me. Let me swim with what God is doing mightily in these days by his holy, holy, holy spirit. And never cease to be amazed that God's put his hand on us. It's in his mercy and his grace. And I'm so grateful that he did. I'll never know why, but that doesn't matter. He has. And so I just want to say to each of you, Continue to be encouraged. Continue to drink deeply day by day. Drink of his word. Drink of his spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for it, Lord. Oh, Father, I truly do believe God's apprehending us afresh. Because we heard a lot about the new day. And I've said, oh, God, I don't want to hear any more about it. I, when are we going to enter it? And I truly believe we have just the start. He is doing a new thing. And I'm saying, Lord, apprehend me. Invite me into this next season. He doesn't force you. He gives you a choice. And I've got both my hands up for, Lord, everything that you want in these days. He comes so powerfully, yet so tenderly, so lovingly, and yet there is a warning with it as well. Like Elijah said, whom shall you serve? If God be God, serve him. And if Baal is your God, well, then you serve him. The line is being drawn. But as for me and my house, we will worship. We will serve the Lord. And Father, we just thank you for your wonderful presence. Holy Spirit, Hover over each one of us. Continue to deepen that well. Continue to draw us. Continue to quicken us in the area of hearing this voice and the spirit of the Lord. Continue to quicken us and draw us to that place of prayer before you. And Father, we thank you in your mercy and your kindness. Oh, the presence of the living God. I know you've resp you're a great responders. I used to respond so often. I dedicate what I previously dedicated. I dedicated that which I previously dedicated. But I said, oh, God. And I don't feel to bring you forward, but I would just ask you, if you feel a fresh apprehending for these days in which we're about to walk into. I just ask you to stay, to stand, say, Father, I put my hand up for this next stage of the journey. Here I am. Here I am. I'm a candidate, Lord. I'm willing. just ask you, God, to seal this in each one of their hearts today. 
we're spoiled for anything less than being called by you, being empowered by you, being equipped by you. Oh, God, being enabled by you to walk in this season. We're truly the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And we, your name, shall be known in Christ Church, in New Zealand, and in the nations of the earth. Glorify your name, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. As we sang that song this morning, we speak Jesus over our streets. We speak Jesus over our families. We speak Jesus over our nation. And I wondered if we could just do that in one accord. Let's declare Jesus, 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 the name above every name. Be so exalted, we pray in your name. Amen, and amen, amen, amen. I think we're up to the baptism of fire. I think I'm, um, this morning I shared, you know, when we first came in that I woke up this morning and bed was so cosy and I was laying there and, um, and I said to the Holy Spirit, I just said to the Lord, I said, I need you, Holy Spirit. And um, then the, the Holy Spirit spoke back to me and he said, and I need you to change.
a couple of weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me and he said, um, he said, Jesus didn't die on the cross. He gave up his life. He wasn't killed. Nobody took his life. He wasn't killed. He gave up his life. And I, that's what I believe the baptism of fire is. It's, it's where you come to that point again and again and again and the Lord just says, will you give up your life? Any ambition or pride or... The Lord's been just putting in my spirit that there's nothing in this world, there's nothing left in this world that has any value other than people. Nothing. All the things that we may have esteemed, <laughs> you know, the houses, the land, the whatever. That's not our inheritance. It's my. Um, I grew up poor. My mum, my dad left and grew up in a state house. Mum working to three o'clock every day to be home for the kids. And my father was a millionaire. My dad died a few years ago, and um, his millions was left to his wife, his second wife, and then. Just a couple of years ago, she passed away, and then his inheritance was meant to come to us, to my sisters and myself, and, and, um, but the, the inheritance was stolen, everything. And um, I was angry. I was really, really angry at first. Thought I've just been ripped off again, you know. And, um, and then the Lord spoke to me about it, and... Uh, you know, he said, you don't have to be offended. <laughs> it's a choice, you know, we don't, we don't, we, offense comes, but choosing to be offended, is, that's your problem. It's, and then, uh, then the Lord said to me, it, it was never, your inheritance is not on the earth. It's not here. It's there. And that the Lord has our inheritance. Well, the Lord said he was coming again and he's back and he, and he said to me it wasn't going to be the same and there's a um, transaction going on now in the spirit and in every single heart in this room and it's like the Spirit of God is saying to every individual person in this room, every single one, will you give up your life for his life? I'm not sure what's happening in all your lives right now, but I'm standing before God.
I'm supposed to be a guinea pig, so... Um, I feel like God is draining out of me any last vestige of any desire for anything this world has to offer. I just, I just feel like all of this natural, worldly, all this life is just, just being sucked out of us.
I keep um, seeing that picture that Anne shared about with her and Peter when they walked, you know, the Lord embraced them and they walked into in the Lord and they were like no longer. And I, I believe that's the invitation of God for all of us this morning. I, I, that's, that's the invitation of that is that the Lord wants us to walk into the arms of Jesus Christ and to be totally lost in his presence. And um, that's, what he, that's what he meant in that prayer. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Sur the surrender. Just um, any of the conference pastors, the speakers at the conference, if if God's put anything on your heart, anything, anything at all, just just come and share.
just want to um, ask for your forgiveness, Lord. A while ago, I was offended. And, um, we always think we have a right. I just want to ask for forgiveness, Lord, for being offended. Because... And only you can change me, God, the internally. And I just ask for your forgiveness. It poisons other people. I don't want to stop them experiencing your move, God. Forgive me, Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider and call for the mourning woman, that they may come and send for skillful wailing woman, that they may come, let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run with tears and our eyelids gush with water. For a voice of wailing is heard from Zion. How we are plundered. We are greatly ashamed because we have forsaken the land. Because we have been cast out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O woman. And let your ear be receive his word. Teach yourself daughters wailing. Teach your daughters wailing. And everyone hear her neighbor's lamentation.
you hear the sound of the Holy Spirit. You hear the sound of the fire of God. The fire comes. But you are called to step into the fire. You are called to step toward the fire. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. To step into the fire is to choose perseverance. It's to choose to persevere with God. It's to choose to hang on to God. When people hurt you, when people abuse you, when people do all manner of things to you, to persevere is to hold on to God. Hold on to God. We love the faith, but God calls us to persevere with our faith because it's in the perseverance that our faith gets revealed for what it is, whether it's gold or silver or wood, hay and stubble. Step into the fire. Step into the fire. Choose to persevere with God. Choose to persevere with God. Oh, I'm one of the old fellas now. <laughs> and I look back over my life and everything that I've gained in God has come through perseverance. Everything. When I started out as a young man, I had visions of how God would use me. I had visions of what I wanted to do for God. Every one of those has been set aside <laughs> because God led me through fire and perseverance. But as I look back on my life, I would not change one thing. Because the most precious things I've learnt in my life have come out of the fire, have come out of the persevering, have come because I chose to persevere. And the things that are yet to come in my life are coming because of perseverance. Young people, I want to challenge you today. The fire of God is for you. The fire of God is for you as you begin your journey into the things of God. Do not be afraid to choose God. Do not be afraid to choose the ways of God. Do not be afraid to give up all for the sake of Christ. <sighs> Embrace the fire. Embrace the fire. It's for you. It's for your generation. It's for your generation. Father God, we just ask you today here that each one of us, you would keep our hearts faithful to you, Lord, that we would be totally focused on the individual call on our lives, Lord. We would be determined and focused. And Lord, we would give you our all. We will not hold back, Father. We will only retain the things that you've told us to, the things that give us life for our spirit. Only that we can keep. But, Father, we would be focused and faithful. Lord, I pray we'd be tender to your voice. So tender, gentle. Lord, when you speak that whisper, that shout, anything that you choose, that, Lord, we will say yes, 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 Lord. We'll say yes to you, Jesus, because your name is the sweetest name and we cannot refuse it. Thank you, Lord.
microphone has become the poison chalice. <laughs> well, the building's open, and the Holy Spirit's here, and, you know, you just need to do whatever you need to do, and um, if you need to be here on the floor or somewhere else, <laughs> yeah. Just do whatever you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. And um, but these, are, these, these are precious, precious moments. And um, I'm so glad you shared, Anne. And uh, I asked if she would talk about Peter. <laughs> and uh, wasn't, it, wasn't it rich? Boy. You know, just... Uh, we need to hear that. We need to hear, you know, we need to hear about the ones that have gone before us and we just need that so much in our life because it just builds so much faith and encouragement and strength in us, you know, for what lies ahead and uh, such a blessing. So, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, we just give all honour. We give all glory to you. We, we want nothing but for your glory to come, for you to be glorified, for you to be magnified, for you to be exalted. Jesus, we, we love you so much. We just love the sound of your name. We love your presence. Uh, we love everything that you've done for us, Jesus. And So we just uh, commit ourselves and this body of believers and these meetings and what you're doing, what you're doing, we just place it all into your hands. We know, Lord, that you will carry us through um, into the next meeting. <laughs> and, uh, Lord, we just, we just want to say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. God bless you.